you need a, do I need a mic? So you can. Uh, now we have a joint session between the AUSM uh, conference and my course, which happens to coincide because I have this class on environmental ethics. Okay, uh, this semester every Tuesday afternoon, and usually I have, as I remember, around 15 to 20 students, but today uh, it's exam period, right? Uh, Midterm exam period, so many students decided to skip this class. Uh, because usually uh, we don't have classes during midterm exam periods. But last week I canceled uh, uh, the class, this class, because I had some urgent business. So, uh, and, and in the syllabus I did not say that today is going to be, uh, uh, you know, a canceled meeting. So, um, it's a usual teaching period. Uh, so hopefully more students will turn up. And uh, the topic today, uh, you can see from the slide, this is a, a, an old slide. You can see it dated from 2007. And I gave this talk at a WHO seminar here in Bangkok. Uh, but the topic happen to fit with the syllabus of the course, which uh, we are going to talk about uh, holism and the, con the idea that not only human beings have rights, whether it is possible for like uh, animals to have rights, uh, we, we talked about this last time, but uh, this time we even go further and we discuss the question whether uh, the environment itself, whether it has uh, you know, rights, uh, whether it deserves protection by virtue of having uh, rights, uh, so to speak. Uh, the environment, the ecosystem, the forests, you know, something is, uh, functions as a whole, uh, a collection of of, of living beings together, a big group of organisms. Uh, do they deserve the status of having rice? And that is the question that, uh, you know, according to the syllabus we are going to discuss today. And it, it fits with our agenda at the AUSN meeting because Many of us have talked about the problem facing the environment. So you know, uh, the ethics of environment has become has become a, a, a global issue and a very important issue. And I, I think a few weeks from now, in the course, we are going to talk about climate change and what are we going to do and then. Uh, what you know, philosophers can do about all that, and so on. So uh, even if it uh, dated from 2007, I think it's still it's still like timely. So uh, uh, and the question won't go anywhere soon. So it kind of sticks with us. So environmental rights as human rights. Uh, that is my kind of uh, proposal. Uh, that is a big conceptual problem, as I said, because the environment, uh, there is the question about what it is and, uh, and, and in what way does it uh, deserve the status of having rights. But uh, I put this as a, a kind of a thesis statement, so I'm going to argue in this paper that uh, we can look at the rights of environment as 
in, in kind of a kind of human rights. So at least they are in the same category, so to speak. So uh, one way to understand this, I think this is easy enough to, to, to understand because we are talking about the rights of individual human beings, which is, you know, uncontroversial. Uh, and they have the rights to <coughs> clean environment, <coughs> right? clean and safe environment. So this is one way to look at the issue. So uh, according to this point of view, the environment itself does not have rights, you know, but uh, it's the human beings, individuals, human beings themselves who do have rights and uh, they have a right to clean and safe environment. If we look at the Universal Declaration, I don't remember uh, there is anywhere there saying that uh, human beings do have a right to clean environment. Perhaps there is, I have to look it up. Uh, but even so, it's more like a secondary right, because the more primary rights in the Universal Declaration uh, mention something like right to, right to life, right to property, uh, right to assembly, and so on. These are very fundamental. But the right to clean environment, uh, I, I, I'm not sure I have to look it up. And uh, one way, another way to look at how, you know, the right to safe and clean environment is related to human rights is uh, to see that uh, the health and the environment are closely related and, and you know, this is also kind of straightforward and uncontroversial. So if human beings have a right to health, which is, I think, people can agree more, more, like, more likely for people to agree on, then uh, as an extension, they have a, a right to clean environment also. And then uh, we have connection with the set of rights mentioned in the Declaration. Uh, through this way of looking, right, right to life, which is definitely in the Declaration on Human Rights, uh, like the first one mentioned, as I remember. Uh, but if we have the right to life, then it implies and the right to health because you know life and health they are closely related and then to the right to a healthy environment so you see the conceptual connections from what is very clearly in the declaration you know agreed upon by every member state of the united nations and then through like conceptual connections we have the rise to healthy environment, which brings us back to what we have uh, said earlier, uh, you know, in the earlier uh, paragraph here. So uh, this is the idea. Okay, and then uh, here we are having a whole new set of rights, uh, community rights which is the rights uh, belonging to the community as a whole. The community could be anything, like a group of villagers in a village. An ethnic group can be very small, like a, a family, uh, or can be very large, you know, a whole nation, for example. The concept of community rights have not been very clearly defined and uh, the examples that fall into this category of community rights and the uh, community uh, communities of individuals are very 
very large. So, and uh, as a consequence, uh, the idea or the justification theory behind the concept of community rights uh, needs to be worked upon more by you know, theorists and philosophers. Anyway, anyway, that does not mean that we cannot use this concept for our purpose of you know, defending uh, the rights of the communities or uh, of looking at communities as a whole and defending the idea that you know, they deserve to be protected in one way or another as a whole, as a community. So, uh, usually rights belong to individuals. You know, very basic idea uh, copied from the textbook. But recently there have been talks about community rights, as I said. Furthermore, the new constitution, I, I, I mean here the new constitution of Thailand. And I wrote this back way back in 2007. So uh, the new constitution here is not here anymore. So it you know, uh, has been torn away, torn to pieces by the coup d'etat, by the military. Uh, two times, 2006, and then uh, two just, just uh, last year, you know, uh, 2017. But perhaps, I'm not sure, I have to, because they, have, they, they we in Thailand have so many constitutions, it's hard to make a count to, uh, to remember which one belongs to which one. But perhaps uh, the current constitution, the, uh, the, the 2017 one, still recognizes community rights because uh, you know, this concept does not belong to political uh, agenda, so you know, it should be there, it should not be just taken away. So, uh, meaning the rights of groups, of individuals to maintain their identities and to look after their own resources. And, uh, in Thailand, we have been talking quite a lot about uh, the role of the villagers, local people who have been living in the forests for a long time. So the forests have become part of their identities. Uh, the effort to, uh, to preserve or to protect the environment of uh, those areas, you know, those forests should include the interests of the local people also. Uh, it has been a controversial issue in Thailand because uh, from time to time villagers who live in the forests have been arrested by the police of uh, they have been charged of uh, cutting down trees inside the forest. Uh, and they claim, the villagers claim that uh, they have been cutting down trees for a long, long time, for centuries, because you know, they remember this is what their ancestors have been doing for a long time. And then uh, the law was, you know, uh, announced, and all of a sudden, cutting down trees inside their old forest. Uh, became a violation of the law. So uh, the people, the villagers, petitioned you know, to, the, uh, the, to, to the government, and they have uh, brought this, this issue to national attention. So people in Bangkok and, and the NGOs and uh, the, the academics started to uh, kind of uh, look into the matter and there were a lot of discussions and debates and then I think 
it became what came up to set the new constitution, the, the constitution, uh, the current constitution, recognized uh, the rights of the rights of groups, groups of individuals, the rights of those villages to their environment, so that uh, outsiders. Uh, are not allowed to enter the areas uh, recognized to belong to those villages without their permission. So that, that is the idea. Uh, that is the idea behind you know, community rights. I don't know if you have the same in your country. We can have a discussion about this afterwards. But this is, I, I'm, I'm reporting what has happened. In Thailand, uh, as regards to efforts to attempt to uh, protect the forests, the environment. So there are some questions. Uh, usually, only philosophers ask this question, but we need to ask them anyway because they have a conceptual or theoretical foundation of what we are doing. So do only individuals or groups of them have rights? Uh, some philosophers believe that only individuals, only individuals, not groups of individuals, only individuals have rights. So only myself or you, or, you know, each one of us has rights. But not uh, all of us taken together as a group. The group itself does not have a right. So, has uh, uh, been criticized quite a lot by other philosophers because uh, they can point to situations where groups of people do have rights. And, and in many cases, uh, groups are recognized by law itself to have rights. And we are talking about corporations or uh, juristic persons like companies, you know, they certainly they do have rights. You know, companies can own things, for example. But what about animals? You know, in the class uh, we talked about this last time. So, do animals like you know lions or giraffes or elephants do they have rights, or the environment itself, you know, the whole thing, the whole ecosystem, the forest? and everything inside, including everything. So, comes to this question. So if all of these have rights, what should we do when these rights are, uh, you know, clash with one another? Like, you know, the right of the individual and the right of the group. Usually they go together because the individual belongs to the group. But sometimes they clash. Right? When an, indi an individual inside a group feels that you know the group has uh, been oppressive to them and they don't want what the group decides for them and they, they want to you know uh, 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 go away for example. So what are the principles involved? Not so easy questions. Uh, so in the readings in the course there are some papers that, that deal with this these uh, questions. So uh, myself and the students will, will have to spell this out later in the coming weeks. So uh, we go a bit deeper into philosophy. Uh, we are talking about ontological status. Uh, for those of you who have not uh, taken to many philosophy courses, uh, ontological status does mean you know, what what is the status of, of a thing uh, in by virtue of its it being a thing, right? Uh, for example, uh, the status of a, a, a stone is that you know, it's a piece of matter. You know, uh, we can perceive it, we can touch it, we can hold it, that kind of thing. So it's there, you know, it does exist. But the ontological status of uh, you know, an idea, 
may be a bit less because you, know, you, you cannot hold an idea, it's not material. Uh, it, it, it is that kind of question. So uh, here we talk about ontological status of groups of individuals. So for an individual human being, there's no question. You know, uh, the human being does exist. We can touch them, we can talk with them, and so on. Uh, they have full legal protection. But what about groups of individuals? There it's a bit more complicated because some groups do have legal status. But legal status and ontological status are not the same thing. Uh, some groups, as I said, have legal status like corporations, companies, uh, incorporated foundations, associations, and so on. But then uh, we have many more ways of forming groups, right? Uh, AUSN uh, students, you know, they are a group. Uh, Chula students, they are another group. Uh, so how do we recognize them? So could we return to our original question? And as long as we are not clear about the ontological status of groups, then we cannot be clear about the uh, rights of groups of individuals. They, the, the two concepts really did not go, go along with each other. So are groups or communities an objective entity in the same way as an individual person? So this question just spells out what uh, the ontological status really means. Uh, just you know, uh, to make it clearer as to what we are talking about. So there is a need to protect the rights of communities. Uh, this is what I, I propose. This is not just a statement of fact, it is a you know, philosophical point of view. Uh, for those people, for those philosophers who do not believe in the ontological status of groups, they say that communities obviously do not have rights. But then how to protect those communities? What they say is that uh, we need to protect the individuals who belong to the communities or to the level of the individuals themselves. And that is a way to protect uh, the community because you know, community is nothing other than just people living together. So that is one another way of looking at the issue. But then it seems to lose something, something that only community uh, possesses and, 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 and not the individuals. And I have here pragmatic consideration. Uh, I've been thinking about this for quite some time. The idea is that uh, we <coughs> sometimes do not have to look at the full theoretical theory uh, justification or full answer to the question concerning the ontological status of groups of individuals. We only point to the idea that in some cases talking about the rights of groups do have some advantages and these advantages if they are useful to us uh, for example if they are useful in protecting the villagers inside the forests as I said then it should be okay it should be this is uh, you know, what is known as pragmatic consideration so we don't need to go into the real truth of things. We look at you know, whether there are advantages in believing this way, talking this way, that it's okay. So it's not, it's kind of it. uh, Non-human animals may have rights in a modified form. Uh, 
So we are talking about the rights of, of like tigers or elephants or deer in the forests. They may, 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 they may have some rights. Uh, this is an alternative. This is an alternate way to say uh, that animals need some protection and they are entitled to such protection. So this is the pragmatic way that I'm talking about. Uh, animals may or may not have rights, you know, uh, in reality. But it's good, it's good to talk of them as if they have rights. Because by talking in that way, they get some protection. So you know, this is pragmatic. This is the idea. So what if the environment itself is entitled to some protection? So we expand the, the boundary of what have rights. Uh, now we have humans and non-humans, right? Uh, then we expand the boundary, so we include the environment itself. So the environment itself has rights in a pragmatic way. So it's, it's good to talk as if the environment has rights. So this is the idea. Uh, if the environment itself is entitled to some protection, then we can also say that it has some rights. Uh, so, continuing on the, the same idea, uh, philosophical controversies aside, you know, this belong more to philosophers themselves, talk about themselves in you know, journals and so on. Uh, but when we get outside of really academic circle, when we talk about lawyers right, and lawmakers inside the parliament and so on, uh, talking about rights seems to be a useful way because you know get people to listen. You know, because when uh, people have rights, uh, there are corresponding duties and so on. So uh, it's, a, it's a good way to get the attention of lawmakers members of parliament and so on, politicians. So when we say somebody or something has a right, what we really mean is that their, their interests should be protected by those who have the power and authority to do so, like the government, like the uh, non-government organizations, uh, groups of concerned people who can lobby, or who can uh, put up some influence uh, politically on, on, on the government and so on. So this is the idea. In this case, uh, just to step up the same idea, you know, to make more uh, clear, there is no need to argue whether there are actually rights as objective entities say, by some individual persons or some objects. Talking about rights is a useful way to employ legal mechanism because after all, right is a, you know, a, a legal word, a legal part of legal language. So it's a way to employ legal mechanism to protect the interests of someone or some groups or some animals or uh, some entities such as the environment or forests or uh, whatever that need to be protected. So we come back to the idea uh, of human rights and community rights. Usually there is a clash, as I said, you know, individual versus the group. So family a problem. Uh, can one claim human rights to jump over, you know, to win over uh, community rights or animal and environmental rights? For example, uh, we in Thailand, we now uh, we are in the midst of the, the, the drama. Uh, about the environment, a 
president of a very large construction company uh, has been found inside a protected area in, in a forest with a group of his followers and a carcass of a, a black leopard, black panther. So everybody in Thailand knows about this. You see a lot of pictures of the black panther everywhere when you uh, look at the newspaper. So he was accused of shooting the, the leopard. And since he is a very influential person, one of the richest persons in Thailand, uh, people are afraid that uh, the law would not be able to get to him. And it seems to be that way because the chief police keeps saying that you know uh, uh, he is uh, free from this accusation, and then some days later he is free from another accusation. So people are afraid that a few days from now he will be free of all accusations against him. So what? Uh, what does it tell us? Uh, he might claim that you know he has human rights. Uh, for example, you know, uh, the right uh, to do whatever he pleases. Actually, nobody has such a right. But let us uh, suppose. Let us suppose that. Since he is the president of Itao Kai, uh, one of the largest companies in Thailand, you see all the uh, expressways uh, inside of Bangkok and many lines of uh, sky trains, they are built by this company. So since he is the president of this company, he has some rights by virtue of his you know, big influential, big person and so on. So this is a useful way when I talk in the, in the class with students so they can put the thing. So can he claim that he has uh, this right to, to shoot the leopard, for example? Uh, and this has become a drama, as I said, in, in Facebook and other social media for many weeks now. And I remember some uh, members of Facebook post this question, uh, you know, speaking like he is a tiger, the, the leopard. The leopard asked, you know, what have I done wrong? Why, why did, did you shoot me? You know, um, I don't know how to answer that, because the leopard was not about to attack. Uh, the, the hunting group in any way. Uh, they were, the leopard was you know, you know, hiding in the forest, but what was shot anyway. And the reason the leopard was shot is a very, very strange one. Uh, Thai people, some Thai people anyway, believe the same way as some Chinese people that by eating uh, by eating certain parts of the leopard, they will get the, the power that the leopard has. So some people believe that you know male leopard they have their own uh, like, you know uh, male organ, right? You, you know about this, right? Uh, and then you kill the male leopard, you can eat the, the male, the, the sexual organ of the leopard. And by doing that, you, the, the power of the leopard uh, is transferred to, uh, to your body. Uh, it comes from China, and uh, Thai people also, some, some of them anyway, including, including uh, you know, uh, the Ikao Thai president. But, you know, that's, that's another issue, uh, local belief, how it influences uh, the behavior and how it threatens 
the environment and so on. So a lot of problems. Now we are back to theory. Uh, local communities in conflict with groups from outside, with various groups competing with one another for the same pool of natural resources, you know, same problems anywhere in the world. What is the best way to share or to distribute the, the, the scarce resources, such as you know, what is there inside the forest, so that everyone and every group gets what they need fairly in order to I don't know. Uh, a lot of questions. So back to the idea I'm proposing. Uh, philosophical arguments aside, the idea is to find a workable policy on health and uh, as well as the rights and the environment that is best for everyone. This is the ideal, best for everyone. But how to achieve that is a big, big problem, a very difficult one. Thus, we need to find a way such that these potentially competing and conflicting rights can live together. Also, an idea. But I think uh, it's achievable. You know, uh, there are certain conditions that have to be obtained before the, the idea can be realized you know, for us to work out. But it's pragmatic because you know, I'm talking about the advantages that would uh, emerge if this, uh, if certain conditions are met. We don't have to go deep into the the, the, the so-called truth of the matter. There might not be such uh, 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 object uh, objective uh, or. Uh, it's, not, it's not achievable, you know. But what is achievable is that we, we find some opinion uh, that uh, we can live with, we can, uh, you know, we find it uh, possible to, to achieve it in our own lifetime, uh, at least, you know, or in, in a manageable period of time. So instead of focusing on the potential clash between rights of, of individual and of the group, you know, <coughs> uh, philosophers are really fond of arguing. We should instead focus on how the two work together. And in some contexts, emphasizing the rights of the individual is appropriate, but in another, it might be more appropriate to talk about the rights of the group. So it depends on context. And in the case where the two do clash, you know, and, uh, the, the case where we cannot escape the clash, uh, an overarching principle, the principle that controls uh, both sides, should be found. This is only possible through negotiation and dialogues, emphasizing empathy that is trying to get inside the minds of the others in order to really understand them. So in case where we cannot escape the, the conflicts, people need to find solution where you know there are really different opinions and people have to talk because people have to make joint decisions. So what I am suggesting is that uh, we, we need negotiation dialogues. Uh, which include empathy, you know, uh, the ability to feel what others are feeling, get inside the minds and the heart of others. And I think this is needed. So what uh, I think uh, we have to leave some time for discussion. So uh, we should be wary of utilitarian principles. Nice talks can conflict with utilitarian principles. And this is more for philosophy students. Uh, so one should be careful of utilitarian principles. The principle that says that whenever we have to make a decision, uh, make the decision that you know maximize the utility or the good feelings or happiness, you know, uh, among the most number of people. Sometimes uh, doing that 
maximizing utility will uh, get into conflicts or violate the rights of certain people involved. So that should, they should be careful. So rights talks will give people a level of protection that is the advantage, uh, below which nothing may happen. And this only depends on the political will and the ability of the authority, political authority, the police and so on, to enforce the principle. So we have a diagram here. Rights imply complication, negative rights means leave them alone and positive rights, you must do something. That's, that's, this is good for students. You know. So they learn about negative rights and positive rights and so on. Thus, we respect the rights and find ways to accommodate them. This is relevant in discussions on sharing of benefits arising from natural resources. After the protection requirement is met, benefits should be shared to all who need them. And those in original possession of the benefits should be given their fair share too. Uh, here is, I'm talking about uh, local people in the forests. Maybe they have their own indigenous knowledge of certain plants and, and uh, herbs in the area, which could be developed into like pharmaceuticals for uh, really difficult diseases. So the benefits should be uh, given back to uh, the local people also. In, in many cases, that has not been the case. It is just kind of robbing uh, the, uh, the local people, the, the villagers of the uh, indigenous resources. So uh, I, I have to confess, cultural considerations should be given due attention in, uh, in any benefit sharing scheme. In other words, culture, including the culture of the local people, what they believe and so on, should be inside the sphere of life of a group. So it should be an integral part of the group of individuals, which is not negotiable. I think that, uh, this is where it can be emphasized. Because we are talking about rice, uh, we are talking. We are not talking about uh, utilitarian principles. Furthermore, in case where the groups share the same culture, cultural closeness does play an obvious role in promoting empathy. Obviously, uh, if we feel closer to someone, we find it. We find it easier. To, to empathize, to, to, to you know, feel what they are feeling. So, so rise to information, to participation and request, uh, and then you know, uh, cultural shaping of this practice also. So there should be a middle way between outright rejection of globalization and market forces and wholesale embrace of the market with no consideration to the environment. In fact, the market has considerable interests in the environment. So some body believes that by protecting the rights of the local people and uh, paying respect or recognizing the rights of the environment and so on will uh, be bad for the market we make people less rich and so on. But, but, but that does not have to be the case, as I, as I say. Because the market itself has a, a lot of interest in the environment. So government should invest in green technology and become partners in, you know, with the industry in, the, the, in this area. And relevance to health, healthy tools, seem to lie more on the side of positive rights. So the right to, to get something, I, I can demand something that's positive rights. So I can demand health care from the government, from whomever you know, responsible. So this means the authorities have obligations, duties to uphold these rights, duties to ensure that people uh, you know, 
citizens uh, in, in, in the, the country need uh, or are entitled to some uh, health care, for example. So I think this is come, this comes by the way of a conclusion. So what rights are there? Individual rights, right to life, public uh, and then right to safe, safe and the environment, as I have said. And then uh, there are also good rights. You know, for example, right of ethnic groups or communities to the kind of environment in which they can maintain their values and identities. And then perhaps uh, animal rights, or rise of the environment itself and of earth rights. You know. The earth itself might have rights, so can do much to the earth. So this includes climate change and so on. Uh, the earth has rights for you. Know. And uh, the earth has to have like advocates because the earth cannot speak for itself. So and it needs advocates, uh, people who speak for the earth, so like, you know, people who study environmental ethics, some philosophers, politicians, who, you know, believe in this and, and so on and so on. The more, the better, I think. So, uh, recommendations. The Human Rights Commission is authorized, uh, blah, 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 and this is from the Constitution. So they should work closely with the Ministry of Public Health and so on. The public should be encouraged to voice their opinions you know, through effective means of participation. And the, the concept of human rights has become more ingrained in, in the Thai public perception, uh, which is positive. Governments should ensure safe and clean environment, and they should collaborate closely with industries to develop clean technologies, for example, like solar power. You know, so, you know, and technologies that can recycle, like plastic water, and so on. So, I think this is the last one. Uh, to, to a lot of time. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sora. It's really. So we have time. Yeah. Discussion. The uh, it's interesting also. Uh, what do you think about the blah 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 of <laughs> United Nations environmental treaties? There are about a hundred or two hundred of these treaties, but still we see the environment being destroyed. So, how can we make the treaties? more meaningful for people to take action? Um, good question. Are you asking me or...? Asking everybody. That's a million dollar question. <laughs> if I have the answer to that question, I'll be a millionaire. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking of the UNESCO. And the UNESCO has... Uh, has uh, uh, declaration on bioethics. Bioethics and uh, yes. Universal Declaration on Bioethics and Human Rights is from 2005. Yes. Yes. It has two articles, one promoting biodiversity as a value itself, yes. but it's non-enforceable. And in fact, the, the articles that it had came really from the Rio de Janeiro inspired conventional biological diversity of 1992. And that is more enforceable, that uh, some mechanisms for control of endangered species, uh, bioprospecting, um, and CITES, which you see the signs of the airport, uh, on trade and endangered species. This is actually has some uh, Legal yeah, mechanism. Thailand is a member in all of these. Thailand is a member. Yeah. And Thailand does enforce everything. sometimes. You know, sometimes they, they are enforced as well. In fact, some people go to jail if they bad luck to be caught and bad luck not to have money to pay the bribe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there is a very 
big trade on. Uh, you know the pangolin? Have you seen one? Pangolin. Pangolin. Yes. So they, they have like nostrils. Yeah. 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 And Thai people, some of them anyway, they love these animals a lot. In Thai, what is pangolin? To a uh, uh, limb. To a limb. To a limb. 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 No, no, no. To a limb. But the bird is not limb. It's not limb. Can you come forward, please? Dear sir, because our friends are listening, they want to hear your words. Yeah, I mean, anyway, I talk louder. You remember, I mean, the conference we did in South Africa, which came out of your own, when we did with Rai, on questioning the universalization of, 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 of environmental ethics. And the problem came as we always, I also said this morning, that the issue of culture is a very complex issue in the sense the way people relate to environment is culturally determined. And if you want to inspire people to protect the environment, you must also understand the way they are related to the environment. Because they are sometimes, as you pointed out, individual. I don't know, that really doesn't question what is meant by rights. Because rights are also culture determined. I was involved in a, a, a project in, in Sudan when they wanted the president of Sudan to go to the international. <coughs> Until today, he's supposed to go to the international court of justice in, 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 in the Hague. And we brought kind of an initiative to protect him, but to question how the United Nations and the, the ICC itself determines uh, human rights. Yeah. Because the way there are certain rights which are culturally determined because of values, whatever. But the point I'm trying to say here is uh, there is asking why, in spite of all these conventions we have, the UN, you're also involved in those issues. Yeah. But still, the environment is being destroyed. But that question also. Uh, you see, as you said yourself, some of these things are philosophical in the sense that who says that is the destruction environment? There are certain animals which are protected through taboo, through ritual, through what you can kill. For instance, in Africa, almost every ethnic group has what you call a totem. It's a particular animal which is like a, a flag, national flag. In other words, if I put fire on the Thai flag, you say kind of lack of respect for the type. So the same thing, there are certain animals among ethnic groups, which is a kind of a symbol of that ethnic group, tranquility. So in that way, culture, rituals, taboos are used to protect that animal. It's a way of protect the environment. And the same thing, I think, was the way in Nepal, but it's something also we do in Africa, that there are second places which we're not supposed to go there either the forest or particular graves or in the environment, the trees, the animals which live in those areas, they don't allow to touch them. But when Europeans came, uh, they did not respect those things. They went there and people thought, ah, if we want to go, go, we can also go. Right? And they started even killing those enemies. In other words, you see there's a conflict of cultures. We respect them because of religion, because of our culture and some Come, someone come from outside and it destroys that belief we have. And people start to come and it destroys the world. Now, come the issue of government also, bringing the code of uh, to harmonize interests of all sections of society. They declare certain cultural uh, values not acceptable 
and people begin now using resources, in particular ecosystems, the environments which initially were not well accepted. So all those things, what I'm going to say here, have made it very difficult for the United Nations conventions to be implemented because they are either not sensitive to cultural aspects or they are violating those cultural aspects. This is why. Another thing is also, as I was saying yesterday, where news values are turned into what? Asian values. There are certain things which were done just for human rights, sustaining. In other words, that kind of symbiotic relationship between human beings and the environment. Yeah. If we to come to East Africa, then we have an ethnic with the Maasai. We have a the Maasai. The Maasai is an ethnic group in East Africa. They are found in Tanzania and Kenya. If you go to the Mongol Street, I was saying it, game reserve. The Maasai and the lion will eat together because the Maasai that will never eat a wild meat. They only depend on their cattle. So, but if you go there, the lion will attack you. But the Maasai can move around with their cattle. No lion or leopard will attack. So there is that symbiotic relationship between human and what? But the government so, comes. The lions won't attack the Maasai. The Maasai, because they live together there. You see what I'm saying? It's but, they attack after but if you come there, the lions will be. Yeah, the people. You're also a human being, but you don't belong to that ecosystem. And there was a particular type of uh, what, okra, what, this mia, whatever. That thing. So that those animals, for years, they are used to that particular aspect. The point I'm trying to say, the question of why environment is destroyed and not destroyed is not just a legal issue. Hmm? It's like behavior. You can't legislate behavior. Eh? It's like the issue of HIV AIDS. You can put all laws, you should, people should do this, but what people do behind the scenes, whatever. And those why we bring cultural leaders, uh, spiritual leaders, to counsel young people, because the relationship between an individual and the spirituality sometimes is stronger than the elixir. So it's a combination of it. That's why uh, three years ago, he was also there, we had a conference on environmental ethics in the context of indigenous analysis. We are trying to question the universality of, of, of what? Environmental ethics. The issue of human rights, the same. Who says this is a human right? Well, the way you look at, uh, we say here, people admire the what? Well, that, um, yeah, but if you come where you come from, you don't want to just float around. And there was a story in, in Zimbabwe where if you catch any of those, you have an audience with the president. So you see, people look at those things different. I have a, a response also to Daryl's question. Yeah. Um, and this response is from my experience as a UN officer whose job is to help governments comply with the provisions of these um, declarations, treaties. All these treaties have language, and these, lang and these language uh, have been put by experts from all over. So they take into account many different uh, contexts. And I've seen that, actually. I mean, I've witnessed the drafting of a lot of these treaties in my time. Uh, that tells you how old I am. <laughs> um, so the cultural aspect is somewhat included in these treaties. What I think is missing is the quantum effect. You kind of touched on that when you said there's a tension between individual and community. Individual rights, yes, because individual activity determines the size of the population and your GDP. So we need to support the individual to act. You wake up in the morning and you act. Our economy depends on you acting. The community, on the other hand, protects the individual. Without the community, the individual will be exposed to ultraviolet radiation. But we don't understand the quantum effect of the community. In the same way, we don't understand the quantum effect of the forest. The forest together protect its individual trees. The tree by itself will die, but in the forest it survives. So there's a quantum effect. And, and I think 
we need to maybe re-examine these treaties and see if their language, the words they use, take into account the quantum effect of these things we're trying to protect, like the environment, the cultures, why the lion doesn't <coughs> attack the Maasai, but he will attack the foreigner. <coughs> the lion receives chemical cues from the environment, including humans. We're all changing chemical cues, signaling, the signals. In Arabic, we say that the zel runs away if it gets afraid, and the lion attacks if it gets afraid. So the lion maybe is afraid of the foreigner. So that's why they attack. But the Maasai is not a foreigner. Yeah, symbiotic. So there's chemical cues. So th there's something out there. It's almost like magic. The scientists does not know that. Mm -hmm. They refuse to understand. Um, because they cannot sense it. You know? Um, I would love to actually find a way to persuade the scientists to, um, to believe in the quantum effect community, the quantum effect of the forest, the quantum effect of the human rights system. It has a quantum effect, but we still don't understand it. So maybe in the future, you know, young people like yourself, you guys, have <laughs> not my job already, I can relax now a little bit, but you guys who are going to carry the mantle, maybe you can look at the quantum effect of these species and, and see um, how we can persuade others, like this man who kills the leopards. Uh, maybe he's right. Maybe there is actually a connection between the sexual organ of the leopard and ingesting it because the genes of the leopard will interact with the genes of the human and they might actually support one another and you might actually feel power. Who knows? We don't know. We just, we haven't figured out the science, but maybe it's there. So anyway, these are all in the quantum realm and I think that is probably the next quantum leap that we need to do. Understand it better. <laughs> so it's uh, in Thailand we we see this uh, kind of thing so many times, you know, we kind of get uh, 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 used to it uh, inside to the fact. Influential people, richer people become immune to the law, so to speak. So go for it. Ladies, go for it. Oh, three things. Oh, one. one. Did, did you introduce yourselves, by the way, earlier? Uh, no. To our dear friends from Thailand? I'm so Marlon from Philippines. Professor Marlon. <laughs> He's also a student <laughs> and a professor. <laughs> okay, uh, first, more often than not, when I read a treaty from any anybody of the United Nations, my first impression is a political thing. <laughs> and I think that it's treated more like a political agreement rather than a practical, a practical agreement. So, that's first. Um, Second is it's about escaping down to the level of the people. People are really ignorant about it, these things. They don't even know. Even in the academy, many doesn't even know that there are universal opinions like these, things like these. Because it remains on the level of the politicians and the policy of the people, which sometimes they don't even cascade it down to the level of the local government, for example. Third is International agreements become parts of the part of the municipal law. I mean, municipal law, meaning national laws. My law agreements, whenever they are signed, they are supposed to be approved by the national government. I don't know. Sometimes that's where the problem is. They don't. The Senate don't, you know, don't ratify the treaty agreement for some political reasons and for some economic, social, developmental goals of the particular country. So it doesn't work in a particular country, although that country's president signed the agreement or the treaty, it remains the level of agreement, but never becomes a reality in yeah. municipal level, or provincial level, or the national level. For example, uh, I don't know, in other countries, if your constitutions state that all agreements and treaties signed become part of the 
municipal law to land. In our current constitution, it uh, was made in 1987. There is a provision that uh, any agreement or treaty that has been approved by the government becomes part of the municipal law, the local law of the land. Uh, so, in our case, it automatically becomes part of the municipal of the local law. So, whether when it is signed and formally ratified by the city, they become official part of the law. They are transformed into a law. But, honestly, are there any treaties and agreements that my country signed and ratified? Only a handful was made into a law. Many of them are environmental. They, they give priority to environmental treaties and agreements. So for example, even the Supreme Court created a mandamus, a continuing mandamus on environment to, to charge government agencies to continually protect the environment. And if they fail, the court will run after them. We have that. And we have a new read. The rate of Kalikasan, Kalikasan in Filipino is environment. The rate of environment. The court can issue a reach yeah. to a particular government office forcing you to do something about the particular environment if it is destroyed. So we have three cases already that the government lost the case in the court because of the rate of Kalikasan or the rate of environment. And that's, a, that's something new and that was the first in the world. But again, it remains uh, winning in the court, but uh, <laughs> when it comes to the implementation of the decision, it, it can't work because it involves also money. We need to give budget to repairing a particular damaged environment. And if that is not the priority of the national budget, and it's not their program, it won't, it won't be given a budget for that particular year or following year or the next year. So the mandamus continues. I think um, the academy, probably many of us are teachers here. <laughs> I think it, it's our responsibility to be able to escape the contents of these treaties and agreements down to the level of the, of the people. In the language that they understand, in a manner that can, they can think of ways, practical ways, simple ways that they can apply in their local community, or whenever they write researches or theses or create projects. Probably let them be inspired by this beautifully written agreements. We don't allow it to remain principles and beautiful words. Uh, I, I know that many teachers doesn't even know the contents of the Paris Agreement, for example. In Thailand, too. <laughs> uh, in Thailand, I think the situation is this. Uh, once the government signs a treaty, uh, there should be uh, provisions that the ministry has to pass their own regulations <coughs> in accordance with the treaty. For example, uh, those concerning the environment. And the uh, regulation of the ministry is enforceable all over throughout the country. But still, it's uh, <coughs> It depends on the people who enforce uh, the regulation in the local areas. So you Yeah, it's fine. I just want to oh firstly it's my Ashley from South Africa. Um yeah I want to follow on something that Professor Kai had mentioned about you know using totems in communities um, and how you know we've got these uh, contemporary things being brought in by other systems. For example, um, some of our family names are directly related to the names or indigenous uh, vernacular names for an, an animal. So if you take the surname of Mglobu in Zulu, in South Africa, it means elephant. And if you take the surname of Nguenya, it means crocodile. And those were the names, surnames, your family surname. So it meant that that is some animal that you would revere in your community. But if you live in South Africa, we now have a national animal. We now have a national flower. So we have to decide between. Yeah. So we must decide between you know protecting that guy. I mean the national animal versus the nat your family animal. You know that kind of thing. So we've got other systems that we have to uh, deal with and, and adhere to and adapt to. 
at the expense sometimes of our own um, you know, uh, systems. That's the first one. The second um, part that you mentioned was um, about you know, the difference between community and individual rights and community rights. And uh, normally the rights you said are associated to protection. You have a right that you can be protected in some other way. Um, and that brings me to the topic we have with traditional medicine, where um, we find it difficult to protect traditional medicine knowledge. Because that knowledge um, it does not belong to an individual. It belongs sometimes to the community. It's community knowledge, or it's maybe you know, specialized knowledge within that community. And also, how do you protect knowledge that's coming from your ancestors from another realm? So there are different mechanisms to protect that, but we have to come up with something new because what we have in place doesn't necessarily have the capacity to protect that sort of knowledge. So if it's knowledge about the environment, but it's so specialized to that cultural group and it doesn't belong to the human race, it belongs to the ancestors, how do you protect that? And then I, when we were talking, there was just two words that came out at me because you know we were talking about if you're in a dilemma, do you protect the tree or do you protect me? You know, if there's a choice, who do you protect? Um, I bring it now back between human and human. Um, this issue of equality versus equity. Do we have such a thing about equality and equity in um, rights, environmental ethics, and human rights? So yeah, I'm just asking, is there, such, uh, is there a concept or there's, are there considerations about equality and equity when we deal with environmental ethics and human rights? Do, do we yeah, consider those these things? are very difficult questions. Uh, as I said, uh, I think we may have to look at the issue on a case by case uh, when, when a case arises. Uh, then we look into the, the uh, specific details about that case and, and try to come up with a decision that is uh, you know, best for that particular case. And uh, the decision might not be the same when another case comes up because the details will be different. So in one case, we may prefer, we may uh, decide for uh, the human. In another case, we may decide against uh, the human. It depends on the, the details. That's what I, I have been thinking. Yeah. The problem sometimes we find when you say you take case by case, that it can be best between the tree and the human. But there comes a time whereby if you get most of the countries uh, in South Africa where the deal of rights, but you don't have a deal of duty. And if you look at most say, traditional society, I think here also in Thailand or among the follow the Buddhism or follow the Hindu, whatever, or in some traditional religion as well. The community comes with the first before the individual. But the laws of the country protect the individual, they don't protect the family. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. If, for instance, there's something which is firmly accepted or acceptable, but let's say the laws, like in South Africa, they say a child what age can abort, is the right to abort. But the family and religion says no, I mean, it doesn't work right. So, you have your own daughter, and then your daughter, for whatever, 12, even 14. The law says no, she is an individual, she can uh, go for abortion or she can take contraceptives. But the family is, is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. So who do you protect? We are in Thailand, we, we are very conservative on abortion. Yeah, so, so there are only a few uh, mm -hmm. cases where uh, the woman can have an abortion if she's raped. And, and, uh, if the baby is carried, uh, the health of the mother will be not 
the life of the mother will be endangered. And I, I forgot the third condition. Uh, only, only in these uh, extreme cases. No, there are even extreme cases whereby, even if, I think somebody pointed to that one, was it in Nepal, yeah. that uh, there's certain religious values, even though things are not acceptable, because you, you can't take human life for whatever reason. See, all those things become a bit very controversial, and as he said that rightly, that in the universal rights or in the concept of human rights, they don't take those things into account. Yeah. Right? And that brings yeah. the question that I was asked, asking, in spite of all these conversations, and that brings the issue a colleague from, uh, from, from Philippines was saying, most people don't understand these things, they just happen on top there. Yeah. And I don't know how many people in South Africa understand the constitution. Yeah. That's why I said uh, there should be a, a, a flaw, you know. Uh, we can talk about uh, having to choose between the community and, and, and the individual uh, in, uh, you know, as much as we want, but uh, we are not allowed to uh, go below the flaw. Uh, and the flaw is made up by the concept of human rights. So. Uh, if the community decides against uh, or decide to do something that would be a violation of the human rights, then uh, it's not allowed. But the issue now, what are those human rights? But uh, I'm talking about general principles. Uh, uh, in order to be more specific, we have to look at the details of the case. <coughs> uh, <coughs> but for your example, uh, if the family wants the woman uh, not to do the abortion, right? And the woman wants to do it anyway uh, in Thailand, uh, the woman will not be able to do it unless she goes underground uh, because this is the situation in Thailand. If she is not raped, if the baby is healthy, uh, if, uh, no, I understand probably it also bring another, she cannot have another it. question. But if you, human rights are universal, why should they apply? Is the human right for human in South Africa to abort, but not the human right for human to abort in Taiwan? So where does, where does humanity stop and then? Uh, there can be no human right to, to end uh, the life of another human being. That cannot be a right. So because uh, the, the, some are saying that uh, the, 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 the uh, fetus, you know, the baby <coughs> inside has the right to life also. But the law of other countries says she had to do it, it's her right. So that we can do that. Yeah, yeah. Many countries they can do that. So it's culturally specific, politically specific. Any country specific. Any country specific. Yeah. Actually, um, I mean, I, I used to work as a human rights officer. Yeah, I know. Um, and I remember receiving a lot of cases. And as a junior officer, I had to quickly distinguish between what I can accept as a violation against a human right and not, and just toss it. And so when I spoke to the experts, uh, what is your criteria for admissibility? And they said, it's simple. You have to make a decision quickly whether um, the person was able to do what they want, whatever the case may be, and the state basically let the person do, or is it the other way around, the state had so much power over the individual that the individual could not do what they wanted to do. So which has more power, the individual or the state? And if the state had more power, it's a human rights violation. So you accept the case and you file it. And if it's the other way around, no. You just throw it away. So that was basically the criteria we were taught <laughs> to help us quickly decide which case do we accept. And so really, it's, it's about pushing back the power of the state and empowering the individual to do more based on what they want to do.
and in every country it's different. The boundaries between the individual and the state are very different. So there is really no universal formula that says, this is your territory and that's my territory. It's a, it's a negotiation. Yeah, a negotiation. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, sorry. Yes. Uh, when Professor was discussing the topic, and he mentioned that in the Universal Declaration, <laughs> I, I, I started browsing. <laughs> Yeah. I can't even remember I'm teaching yeah, yeah. Roman rights, but suddenly I yeah. realized I, don't remember I, I can't yeah. find it. But, but uh, in the in the constitution that we have, there's a specific section: the right to a healthy and safe ecology and environment in our constitution. There's yeah. a specific in the Bill of Rights, yeah. uh, section three yeah. of the constitution. It's specific there that. Uh, we have the right to healthy and balanced and safe ecology. That is why we have these two laws made by the Supreme Court, the OPOSA law, yeah. uh, which is all specifically for the rights of future generation to inherit a healthy environment. So the court, oh, we don't uh, you, can bring, you can bring the elderly, <laughs> You, they can bring us to court if the kids can bring us to court. Yeah. If we don't protect the environment for them, we call it the intergenerational justice. So, and the children won the case. <laughs> That's the case that I was studying. They brought to court the officials of the Department of Environment and Natural yeah. Resources for failing in their job to yeah. give them a healthy ecology in the future. And they won the case in the court. Yeah. So, it's in the concept of the intergenerational environmental justice under the apostle. I don't think we have that in our constitution. <laughs> yeah. I think another situation on the question of environmental health. Let's say look at the case of China, yeah. which is almost considered the factor of the world, where industries have been built now for economic growth, polluting the whole environment. So, and it's not acceptable to the right to the what, a clean what, environment. Now, can the people take the government to court? The government wants the economy to grow. And you see the consequences of, 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 of whether it's future or future cost, whether if the environment is clean or if you need the factors. Yeah. People benefit by getting jobs, but at the same time they suffer by having a, 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 a polluted environment. Yeah. So we see all those competitions. Yeah, I don't know about China, but in China it's sometimes possible because we have uh, the administrative court. So this is the court where the people can bring a case against the government. Uh, whenever the government uh, uh, extends or uh, oversteps the, the limits of their power and uh, encroaches upon the, the rights of the people, so the people can bring this to court. And uh, many of the cases uh, brought to the administrative courts concern the environment. Yeah. And usually the people win when the case goes to administrative So it's a one, one uh, positive, more or less positive aspect of the Thai system. Uh, so only the, the national politics is the problem. But other than that, it's quite okay. When the government uses the stop the factory, uh, <coughs> usually uh, the people will uh, win. Uh, but if it's uh, the private factory and uh, the uh, private citizens, then uh, the issue. I'm not sure it becomes more complicated. Would it be a nice? It depends on you know uh, uh, the regulations and who can demonstrate the harm to the environment. Okay. Yeah. 
By the way, would it be nice that everyone could say their name and where they're from? Because we have a, people from many countries here. Yeah. Osama, could you start and go okay. around? Um, hello everyone, my name is Osama Rashkan. I'm from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. I work uh, here in Bangkok at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific. Sorry for the long name. <laughs> I work as a social affairs officer. Thank you. And you're from Bangkok or? Which province? It's So are you going to go to graduate school to do a PhD? <laughs> what are you going to study? Bioethics and philosophy? <laughs> we are all studying bioethics, so we think it's the best subject. <laughs> nice to meet you. My name is Osman and I am second year of this university. Thank you. So, Okay, hello everyone. My name is Mohamed Sirihana. You can call me Vicky. Uh, I'm from Indonesia and I hope that you can you learn about my life and you can talk about it. I'm a director for um, the foundation in Indonesia is for education and therapy for children with disabilities. Thank you. So I'm uh, yeah, Daryl Mesa, Kiora. I'm from Aotearoa, New Zealand. But I worked for 10 years for UNESCO as a regional advisor based in Bangkok. And I work closely with Sorat, so I'm yeah. quite often here. And we have an office on the eighth floor, Biofics and Life. Yeah. Right, uh, the center has uh, its office on the eighth floor. Uh, my name is Sorat, and now I teach philosophy here. So. Uh, these are my students, and we are having the course on environmental ethics this semester. And I'm glad to welcome the members of AUSA and the conference to July to Bangkok. Thank you. And so we're also, most of us are students of Professor Sorat, as well as professors. And uh, there is also. Yeah, including me. <laughs> and I'm also a student and professor. Yeah, so. We've been working together like more than 10 years. 20 years now. We're getting on. <laughs> and we worked a lot in Asian bioethics to discuss Asian bioethics. And one of the topics that Sorat mentioned uh, was the conflict between the imposition of new laws on tribal people and indigenous people who lived together in the forest for a long time right. and then and uh, we have in Kankuchan in the Peace Park in the National Forest there it's always the police are sometimes taking the uh, telling the indigenous people off or punishing them for using their community forest that is their home and it's their home more than it's the policeman's home or the government's home it's their home and so but this is a dilemma how do we protect because usually the overuse of resources is from people outside the community. Sometimes 
it's a uh, because a species becomes endangered in an area because of all the other areas the species was lost. So now we try and stop that practice of... Um, and the same animals used to migrate <coughs> between habitats, but now they are only safe in the national forest if they stay there. And then they're not safe if, if the tribes still continue to, to use them as they used to. Um, so this is a is a dilemma. We have in other countries too. This challenge, yeah. Um, how many forests do you have in Saudi Arabia, Osama? Any forests? <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good question. I, I once attended actually a conference at the American Embassy in Riyadh, and they asked that question. And and then the guy was saying, "Look, you Saudis, you should just sign every." pre-protection treaty. You don't have any to protect. Just sign them and you get credit for them. I'm like, <laughs> so, so yes, to, to answer your question, well, not many. Uh, but now that I live in Thailand, I have come in contact with a lot of places. Yes. And I've learned a lot from the forest fire. <laughs> <laughs> Like in the mountains? Or yes, in the south. south. Yeah, northern, um, southwest Saudi border with north Yemen. There's a there's a mountainous area called Tihama, and it's very high and it's all a forest. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, it's very cold weather, and even the people who live there they look different than the rest of the population. They have very beautiful features actually, <laughs> similar to their environment, <laughs> and um, they tend to be very healthy. Uh, very strong, and uh, they have different diet, of course, than the rest of the population. They don't have the same level of development uh, because they tend to live far away from the reach of, of civilization. But they they have their own indigenous culture, their own practices. Uh, their women, for example, don't wear the hijab. Um, men, for example, are, are allowed. No, they they must see the full body of the woman before they marry her. That's part of their culture. Otherwise, the marriage is not legitimate. Um, so they have practices like this. Um, some foods are allowed. Um, some drinks are allowed. Um, so anyway, they have their own indigenous ways, and they seem to be thriving and doing very well. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I would love to go and write a PhD on them. <laughs> <laughs> Your next one. You just started. Yeah. Yeah. So.